Tonight we're talking about natural remedies for home health, for like, how do you treat flu and cough? And, um, you know, my, my great aunt was just admitted to the hospital earlier this week for pneumonia and, uh, they didn't do anything. I mean, I definitely believe there's a time and a place to admit people to the hospital for severe sicknesses. So I'm in no way, shape or form discouraging medical care when needed. Please do that. But it was very clear within a day or two of her being there, she was actually getting worse. And so she asked to come home. So we brought her home and just started doing all the herbal remedies we knew of, which actually is just one recipe plus um, a few topical things that I'm going to share with you tonight. And within like two days, she was like, like a hundred percent change direction of, you know, she was going down and now she's going up and, um, she should be back on her feet by like tomorrow or the next day. So these, the remedies I'm going to share with you tonight have very powerful, powerful, uh, I would, I would say pharmacological effects on the body. However, technically you only use the word pharmacological, uh, you only use that term when you're actually talking about pharmacy medicine, but it is important for you to know that in, in many countries, and I would have to double check what percent of US based medicine, but many countries, you know, you're looking at 80% of pharmaceutical drugs are actually based on plant compounds. And so when I, when we talk about plant medicine and herbal medicines, I mean, these things have extremely powerful chemical effects on the body, which is where many pharmaceutical drugs even originated from was just looking at what are those bioactive compounds in herbal medicine and can we isolate that and put it in a petroleum derivative, which is what 99% of pharmaceutical drugs are is a petroleum derivative. And I'm not making that statistic up um, of some kind of bioactive compound. And so I understand the pros of wanting to isolate a compound so that you can make sure you have the same dose in each time you take it and you have the same dose for when you're doing clinical trials, because just to give you an example, you know, if have you ever heard of the term terpene, a terpene is a class of compounds that it, it cut, like there's so many different terpenes. There's like, I know of hundreds, but there's probably thousands of different terpenes that appear in plant medicines. But here's the, here's the kicker. The terpene, uh, what would you call it? the potency of the terpenes in a plant will vary significantly plant to plant in region to region. So I might have lavender grown in Norway that's going to have a completely different terpene potency or terpene level than a lavender plant grown in my backyard in Vegas, or is that, I don't live in Vegas anymore, but um, you know, California or Canada or South America. And so I understand like the benefits and the whole rationale behind like, okay, if we can, you know, pull out the part of lavender that's super helpful, which there's a lot of parts of lavender and this is why you should not isolate a plant. But anyway, if we can pull out the bioactive part that we know has a medicinal effect on the body, and if we can like, this is five milligrams or this is 100 milligrams that actually is safer and more reliable in terms of clinical trials and in treating someone than like kind of sh just hoping that the herb you're using has the same medicinal properties as the last bottle. Okay. So this is where that even came from. You know, the whole concept of like, let's pull it out, let's standardize the dose. And we know that each time you take one pill of this, it's going to equal five milligrams or 15 milligrams or, you know, one gram. And that's more reliable for, for doing studies. That said, what you lose in the process are all the other chemicals that that plant contained that actually do contribute to this synergistic, synergistic effect of, you know, that plant. So tonight's call, I get to tell you about some of my favorite herbs and my family's favorite herbs that we use to heal the human body growing up. I mean, these things are powerful. In fact, I often say like one of the biggest issues with natural medicine is that people don't take it seriously enough. They start throwing essential oils all over the place or ingesting them or just supplementing with things that can be very potent. And uh, now I, there are of course, some herbs that you can take in high doses and it's like only slightly different than, you know, eating a big salad. Um, but there's other herbs that are like very powerful and especially when it comes to essential oils and extracts, you know, things where like you're taking like pounds and pounds of a plant and getting in a very 
a potent extract out of it. That's where you really want to be careful. So anyway, we're going to jump into it tonight. That's my introduction. And uh, it's great to see you all. So hello, everyone. Lovely to see you. Avery, nice to put a face to the name. Um, I've heard your name flowing around, so it's great to see you. Ronnie, good to see you again. Love that smile. Hello, Tammy, and hello, Jeanette and Maria and Rita. So it's so great to see you all. Um, I'm going to, I actually want to uh, take this call standing up. So please give me a second while I heighten my desk. While I'm doing that, um, please go ahead and throw in the chat, what's the most delicious thing you ate today? I would love to know. Of all the things you drank or ate, what's the most delicious thing you ate? Also, I see uh, we have Jermaine back. Jermaine, I missed you on our uh, Tuesday night call. So I don't know if you want to have work or what your excuse is, but it's good to see you again. Okay, so we had some blueberries. Oh, a chippy salad, that sounds great. Greek salad and turkey slash chicken sausage. Okay, that sounds phenomenal. Homemade chicken soup, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. Chicken curry, apple salad, oh my gosh, that sounds, Melanie, do you have a recipe for that? Um, Please share it, that sounds incredible. Okay, ginger tea, absolutely. Sauteed yellowtail snapper. <sighs> um, How is it that we do not have like a group chat of recipes going for HAG that we can just like take pictures of our food and share it all in favor of like a WhatsApp group or something? I wanna start learning what you guys are making day to day because this looks delicious. Vegetarian ramen with poached egg over peppers and sweet potato. Um, I love my friends. This is a community of chefs. So thank you, everyone. I am, um, I'm doing a water fast because I just feel like after the holidays, I was just like, I, I, I'm a serotonin dominant person. So my like propensity to eat carbs is very high. Okay. So I just was getting so carby and I was like, you know what? I would really benefit from a fast. So I am doing just a three-day water fast. I'm at the end of day two. And I just want to mention water fast should really be called salt water fast because it's like a hundred times easier if you eat enough salt. Like anytime you're getting a headache on a fast or your kidneys or adrenals hurt, just make sure you're upping your minerals because most of the symptoms of headaches and stuff that happen during a fast is actually just a mineral imbalance. And so I don't know why the web only talks about water fasting and they don't have it like in bold letters, like mineralize your water or you will experience adrenal fatigue. Like it very much so helps to add minerals and salt to your water while you're fasting. So anyway, that's, I am loving hearing what you're writing here as far as food goes so that I can make that later on this week. So thank you everyone. All right. So we are going to jump into tonight's call topic. Now, have you guys ever noticed that when you look up natural remedies online, sometimes they give you very surface level answers. If you're like, how does this work? And it's like, oh, it decreases inflammation and it is an antimicrobial agent and it improves your digestion. And you're like, okay, that's nice, but how and why does that work? Like, I'm glad it reduces inflammation, but I don't know what inflammation really is in the body. So could you give me some more details on how this actually works? Here's a, a quick tip for you guys. If you're ever researching something online and you want to get a deeper answer, you need to include the word mechanism of action in your search. So if you're like, I want to know what is the mechanism of action of olive leaf extract? What is the mechanism of action of Ceylon cinnamon? What is the mechanism of action of berberine in diabetes? Make sure you include those three words because now you just differentiated yourself from the whole pool of Google users who just want like a surface level answer. And now you're talking scientific terms. So that's going to lead you to a page of search results where then you can go look for peer-reviewed studies produced by the National Institutes of Health or some other, um, you know, great portal. I, I would definitely look for peer-reviewed articles though. And I'm going to give you some examples on tonight's call. And you can go there and get a way deeper understanding of like, okay, when they say cinnamon is anti-inflammatory, what that really means is 
in the guts of people and lab rats who consumed cinnamon, it inhibited interleukin-6 production, which is one of the primary pro-inflammatory molecules made by your immune system to induce inflammation in the body. So when you take cinnamon, okay, it's inhibiting interleukin-6 production. What else is cinnamon doing? Oh, it's actually breaking down the cell membrane of harmful bacteria and boosting the production of helpful bacteria. So you can go in there and like learn why are these chemical agents working the way they are in the body? And it's very fascinating. So I am going to go ahead and start off with uh, I was going to say I'm going to start off with cinnamon, but I'm tempted to start off with some recipes so that you have context for how these things are put together. And then we can kind of break it down into its individual parts. So who here has ever done uh, Ayurvedic practice, some form of Ayurvedic medicine, which comes in many forms from like customizing your diet to your body type, but especially it comes down to using spices as medicine. Who has ever made an Ayurvedic tea or used spices as medicine? Okay. All right, cool. So we're like 50, 50. Great. So one of the most go-to recipes in my household growing up and throughout college and to date is making what we call Ayurvedic tea. Now, if you don't already have this recipe, I'm just going to jot down what are the main ingredients in that. But this is our number one concoction we make. Uh, in a mug of warm water when we start to feel ill. So it's a combination of ginger, cinnamon, black pepper. If you can tolerate cayenne pepper, even better. Most of them say as much cayenne pepper as you can handle. We will talk about potential contraindications of that in just a moment. Um, turmeric, honey, lemon if you have lemons available if you want to throw garlic pepper in there great or just garlic sorry not garlic garlic pepper freshly i don't know why i said garlic pepper freshly squeezed garlic and then um optionals would be like cardamom it's phenomenal cardamom is a great thing you can add um cumin cumin's very powerful and uh anise is another option and anise, funnel. Yeah. So I would say if you, as long as you get five of those in there, you're good. So like my go-tos are like turmeric, ginger, pepper, honey, lemon, and uh, nutmeg. Okay. Like any of those, but I, we're going to start getting into some of these ingredients right now. But one of my favorite things uh, when I got to college is I found this Indian restaurant and they would sell jars of honey that had just tablespoons and tablespoons of cinnamon, ginger, turmeric, um, pepper, and uh, um, what else would there have been in there? It was one other spice just mixed into the honey, and they sold it as jars of medicine, not as a spice for your food. It was it was Ayurvedic medicine, and that's what they sold. You could buy it for $15, this jar of like honey from, it was actually Sri Lanka, um, honey from there with all these herbs mixed in it. And like that's, and that's medicine that goes in your medicine cabinet. So then anytime I would start getting sick at college, I would like grab a mug of warm water and mix in a tablespoon or two of this and squeeze a lemon and like, boom, four hours, sore throat, gone. Like that tickle in the throat. And when you start to get sick, dunzo. So it's a great way. It's a great thing to have on hand for those early stages of sickness. Um, while we're in the mood of recipes, I am going to share the pneumonia recipe that literally got my great aunt out of the hospital within three hours of her trying it. So this is very powerful. She was having excessive coughing fits and, uh, um, and the doctors, well, we're in Hawkinsville, Georgia. So if you guys think that there is like a full blown lab running 24 seven here running like viral and, uh, bacterial panels on, you know, samples uh, of people's saliva and coughing extracts. Like, no, this is like, oh, haven't been in a hospital that old in a long time. That said, staff is wonderful and I absolutely love them. But she was there for, you know, a day and a half and they weren't able to run, you know, labs or get more specific with um, what her needs were. And so she, her coughing was actually getting worse and worse. And, um, so mom shows up the next morning with this concoction and uh, 
it like literally almost immediately stop her cough. Now that said, sometimes it's going to suppress the cough, but other times this stuff actually works as an expectorant. And what it does is it loosens up the mucus that is formed on the inside of the lungs so that when you cough, you can get that junk out easier. So less coughing isn't always the goal. Sometimes we want more coughing, but we want an expectorant is going to help loosen up the mucus so that that mucus can then carry that um, pathogenic material or whatever it is the lungs want to get out can successfully carry that out of the lungs. So just keep that in mind. You don't always want to suppress a cough. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and throw the pneumonia be gone herbal tea in the chat. It's also in the human body master guide. So for those of you who have the human body master guide, um, it's called Karen's pneumonia be gone herbal tea. And the stuff is epic. So I am just transferring this video. I mean, this image to my phone so I can drop it in the chat and then we will read it off as a holistic family. All right, it's being dropped there and I'm gonna start sharing my screen and we will read it together. So definitely keep this on hand. And yes, this is a picture of her text to my sister. So don't mind that. So we got cinnamon powder, one quarter to one half teaspoon, ginger, one to two teaspoons crushed or dried, goji berries, which is one of the most common components of Chinese medicine that you will ever find. It was in like all their tea recipes in the pharmacies when I, when I was living over in Taiwan, they put goji berries in almost everything. Um, dried rosemary leaves. And we just made our own rosemary, you know, powder this summer. Now dried mullein leaves. This is extremely powerful for topical as well as internal use when it comes to cough. In fact, this is considered probably the king of herbs when it comes to coughs. So definitely that's a staple. And like I said, you can do that topically by mixing it with um, water and just putting it on the chest directly um, or boiling it in tea. Dried whorehound. We ran out of whorehound. Um, we need to get more of that, but that's kind of a unique thing you might not have on hand um, if you suddenly fall ill. So you might want to order that ahead of time. Echinacea, um, basil, fresh or dried. So we put in a heaping tablespoon of basil, honey to taste and cayenne pepper as much as you can tolerate happily. Now boil all ingredients and lower to simmer and simmer for 20 minutes. Strain and add a freshly squeezed lemon or a few drops of peppermint essential oil or both enjoy warm or cold. So that is the recipe, okay? Ooh, Mountain Rose Herbs is an amazing resource for organic non-GMO herbs. Thank you for that. So Mountain Rose Herbs is great. And then we also love um, Herbally Grounded out of Las Vegas. We get a lot of our herbs from them, but I've heard great things about Mountain Rose Herbs as well. And soon Lily Fields will sell herbs, but not until we get a new farm manager to plant our greenhouses for us. So the greenhouses are built. We just haven't started planting the herbs yet. <laughs> Epic. All right. So that's a great tea to have on hand. And she would have a mug of that like every few hours and it significantly um, sped up the process. So before I proceed into mechanisms of action, does anyone want to add anything to the recipes or share anything related to that or their favorite tips of use just before I move on? Yes, Jeanette. So that's the garlic honey. This is, um, I made it in May. I don't know if you can see it. I have poor lighting here, but um, I when I start getting sick, I just take a spoon or eat some of the chunks of garlic in there. And it's just honey with garlic. So that's one, yeah. Did you Did you ferment that? I did, it's fermented, yeah. Yeah. So every day you put honey and I've got, I'm going to be making some more, so I'll make you a video, but, um, I always keep it in my back stock and always sending it off to my kids. Cause they're, you know, get, get sick, but, um, just honey. And then like a couple cloves of garlic depends on how much honey you're using. And then every day you just kind of turn it and you burp it. So you release the gas or you can use one of the They've got these little nipple things that will 
automatically release the gas. So, but you still want to stir it a little bit, you know, just turn it. So okay. there's that. And that. then this, this is a good book also. Um, it's got some Ayurveda recipes and um, Seda Veda. So ancient, ancient secrets of a master healer. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, cool. Thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, uh, awesome. We have, uh, so how do you guys say Mullen? Cause I've heard Mullion and I've also heard Mullen, but what's like, what's, can we establish a pronunciation for this word before we keep using it for the next five minutes? Mullen. Just like that. Are we good? Okay. Mullen. 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 Woo. Thanks guys. Epic. Okay. So Julie said Mullen leaves can be burned the same way you smudge with sage and inhale the Mullen smoke into the lungs. Julie, I've never done that. That's incredible. Wow. Thank you so much for mentioning that. What an incredible use of that plant. And then Nailani said, um, Mullen was the most effective thing I had against COVID too, plus diffused hydrogen peroxide. Yes, totally. We also used that in our um, nebulizer hydrogen peroxide during, during COVID. So epic. Wow. Thank you both for that. Another addition, I have treated lung things with garlic, poultices on the feet, totally. Breaks up pneumonia in a day or two. Wow, day or two. Thank you, Nilani. I haven't busted that one out on uh, Auntie Lana yet, so there's more to do here. Thank you. So, the, however, there are um, certain herbs that, or I mean, there are concoctions that use um, the actual garlic, um, not the garlic bulb, but the rest of the plant. And so, um, I think somewhere along the line, I just got that a little mixed up in my head. All right. So now it, real quick, when it comes to contraindications, this is directly related to mechanisms of action. So someone just mentioned like, you know, if you're dealing with MS or, um, certain heart conditions, some of these plant medicines are actually, uh, so fast acting on the body that there may be times where it's not in someone's best interest to take it, um, especially in high doses. So I'm going to get into a few of the, uh, a few of the ingredients right now, and then we can talk about contraindications at the end. So first thing I wanted to discuss was, uh, say was cinnamon. Okay. Now cinnamon, for those of us who grew up, we use this thing as a spice, right? We're just like, Oh yeah, throw it on your oatmeal. Like love cinnamon in my latte, love cinnamon on some, uh, toast with sugar. So it's definitely delicious. However, um, this is one of the most potent medicines that have been, that has been used for literally thousands of years. And when I was looking up the mechanisms of action of cinnamon today, and I'm going to share my screen here in a minute, it was just absolutely incredible how many different things cinnamon does. So I'm going to begin sharing my screen. Let me just pull up the, the page I want here. Now, the reason why I'm, I want to share my screen is because while you come and study at HHE, we want to ensure you have the skill sets of doing your own research as best as possible. Now, yes or no, there's actually is a lot of misinformation out there. Yes or no? Yeah, there is. And here's the reality. Um, people in natural healthcare, because we tend to be like, a, you know, against the system a little bit in a good way. And not only that, it seems to be the more you follow misinformation, the healthier you get. So we have like a high propensity to like go against the establishment and, and like accept the information that's coming out from independent, ideally independent, but most of them are now at attached to supplement lines. Okay. So that's why it's not so independent anymore, but you like look for independent or, or con contrary sources for health information. Um, yeah, the problem with that is because there's not the same level of like peer reviewed scrutiny, you really do get some pieces of misinformation floating around. Um, and I remember distinctly like during COVID, um, it, you really like, I mean, I studied epidemiology for eight years, which is the, you know, it's the use of statistics to study the clinical trials and the cause and spread of disease in populations. 
And I had to spend like 45 minutes sometimes just like digging through some of these articles that were coming out of natural health resources. Cause I was like, that doesn't sound right. And big red flag, you guys, anyone, anytime someone tells you like the math is simple, it's like, oh, the math is simple. Like this is what came out in this clinical trial. Like the math is simple. Just take that as a huge red flag because when you're actually doing clinical trials, there is so much to account for. We call it regressional analysis because you're trying to account for like any potential correlations that could be throwing off the true result of the study. It is the most, some of the most complicated math I've ever seen in my life. So just don't ever think it's that simple and, um, and be critical, like be very critical of the information that comes into your, into your newsfeed. Cause I would say during the co during like the COVID era, it was probably about a 50, 50 toss up between research articles I read that I felt like were completely like scientifically legitimate and were intentionally being censored by mainstream medicine and mainstream media in order to ensure the agenda of making people think we were powerless over COVID, even though this was the ninth strain of coronavirus we've seen in the past many years. Um, you know, they really were trying to control the narrative there to make people completely dependent on the system and not be doing their own research. So there was about half of the articles that I was like, wow, this is like a crime against humanity that they're suppressing this research and absolutely everyone should know about it. But then the other half of the articles, I was like, man, they jumped to some conclusions there. Like they really did. They, uh, that was a uh, not what I would consider responsible research. So this is just to say, you know, be critical of the information you consume. And please, if you ever have a question about an article, will you bring that to HHE and we can look at it as a group and say like, hey, let's have a critical view of this piece of research and, um, you know, look where are they getting their resources from and what were potential conflicts of interest. So, and that's not to say I just always love, believe in peer reviewed research. Because the last thing I'll say about this, I did my senior thesis on the current state of clinical trials of alternative cancer therapies. And the predominant articles opposing natural remedies in the use of, of cancer treatment were funded by 21st century oncology, Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer. So it, I'm smiling right now, but believe me, I was enraged at the time. And uh, so, yeah, that's not to say peer reviewed is always, you know, completely unbiased because it's not. However, um, they do have their butts against the wall to make sure they're using the correct um, methodology in their research assessment. So thank you for tuning into my soap opera on um, being a critical consumer of natural health information. And it's such a beautiful time to be alive because there is so much more info on the mechanisms of action behind natural medicine now than there ever has been. I'm going to start sharing my screen now. All right, so medicinal properties of true cinnamon a systematic review. So in this case, it looks like I actually just plugged cinnamon into pubmed.com, which is one of my favorite places to go for research articles. Um, you can either do that, or like I said, just Google mechanisms of action of cinnamon, and then click on, a, on an article that comes from NIH or another peer reviewed resource. So I'm reading this and I come down here to the results. And I just wanna read some of these off. The beneficial health effects of cinnamon were, antimicrobial and antiparasitic activity, lowering blood glucose, blood pressure, and serum cholesterol, and antioxidant and free radical scavenging, you know, it has antioxidant and free radical scavenging properties, inhibition of uh, tau aggregation and filament formation, which are hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. It has inhibitory effects of osteoplastogenesis, that sounds like it's related to, um, uh, you know, bone degeneration, but I, I would have to look that up. Um, I am not, okay. Who wants to give letter F a shot? anti secretog I don't know that one actually, and anti-gastric ulcer effects, anti-nociceptive and anti-inflammatory activity. And I'm going to actually get into that one wound healing properties and hepatoprotective effects. So did you guys know cinnamon had all of that going on when you like were throwing it on your oatmeal? Did you guys know? Like, look at this A through Z. Well, it's actually an A through 
I list. Incredible. So we're talking heart disease, cancer formation, uh, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, you know, pathogenic infections in the body, neurodegenerative diseases. This thing is working in a lot of different ways. So then I just wanted to get a little bit deeper on exactly what's going on here. This paper broke down the specifically the anti candida. Um, activities. And this one was, this article was actually emphasizing how the smaller particle size you have, the more effective it is. So it was talking about nano encapsulation of essential oils. So as opposed to just like traditional um, essential oils, there's now new technologies. And this one was studying, um, what was the mechanism of, uh, of achieving the particle size they were going for? Response surface methodology to um, break up the particle size. Anyway, but this one had, again, incredible antibacterial activities you know, and effects against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And um, this one's at a fourfold um, cytotoxicity reduction compared to the non-encapsulated. So the part, small particle size does matter. Um, but that's very powerful. So then I looked up like, how is it antimicrobial, like antibacterial, what is it doing? And it turns out that it breaks apart the uh, cell membrane of these harmful bacteria. So we're like, okay, so it weakens the cell membrane and inhibits some enzymes needed for that bacteria to reproduce itself. So like all of your DNA um, like and cell reproduction is all modulated by enzymes, enzyme spark reactions to tell things to break down, tell things to build up. That's what your enzymes do. They spark reactions. And so if you have a compound that can inhibit enzymatic activity, you know, in a certain, um, you know, class of, of, of molecules, or in this case, bacteria, um, that is going to stop its reproduction. But then my next question was, okay, so we know that it breaks apart the cell lining of bacteria. I'm like, but it does it do that for the good bacteria too. I was, I was starting to get concerned. And so that led to my next question. Oh, I wrote, does acromancia survive cinnamon? I was just like curious because acromancia is um, a phenomenal strain of gut bacteria you all have. Um, well, hopefully you have it. You might not have it. And in fact, people who are lower in acromancia are at greater risk of all of the top 10 killers of disease, like heart, like high blood pressure and diabetes and stroke and cancer. So acromancia is, um, you know, positively associated with a better longevity and, you know, reduced risk of all these major diseases. So we're really trying to get levels of acromancia higher in North Americans. We have one of the lowest levels of acromancia of every place on planet earth, probably because of our um, low fiber diet. Acromancia loves fiber. Um, yeah. So that said, I wanted to know if it can survive it. And then that led me to this article that said, it, this is great. I want to throw this one in the chat. Um, this one is going into um, how cinnamon, so this is the primary uh, like active like biochemical compound in cinnamon, and it promotes the intestinal barrier functions and reshapes gut microbiome in early weaned rats. So when something's reshaping the gut microbiome, that's a good sign that it, you know, it's affecting some classes of microbes, but not others. So I wanted to know like, what are the different classes of microbes? And if we have time, I actually want to walk you through this whole paragraph because it's very fascinating. Um, but I'm going to jump down here and it said, furthermore, uh, this compound from cinnamon remodeled the gut microbiome structure at the genus level so that these levels of bacteria were increased, whereas these level of bacteria were decreased. Um, and these ones are the most pathogenic. Um, some of these can go either way. Acromancia, generally speaking, always a good guy. Bacteroids can be gram negative and be harmful to the body. Um, um, Clostridium is a, um, um, this one in particular is known for helping produce butyrate, which is an important short chain fatty acid. However, I believe there's a class of these that also turn into C. diff. So it's not like everything within that class is good for you. Um, I didn't know about this one. 
I, this was a new one for me, Psychobacter. But then this one, this guy here, I don't know how to say it, Intestina, Intestiamanas. Um, but this is also a significant producer of butyrate, which is a very important molecule made by your gut bacteria. So you guys, just to reiterate your good gut bacteria, they're producing nutrients for you. That's why they're good for you because they produce nutrients. They're not, they do break down food. They do help break things down. So it's not just that they're producing nutrients. They, they aid in digestion, but one of the most important things good bacteria do for you is they produce nutrients. And one of those important nutrients is called butyrate. And so that's made by a few of these guys. So this is very cool guys, because cinnamon is is acting against the harmful pathogenic bacteria and actually helping to bolster the good guys. Now, is that balance happening because the cinnamon is just killing off the bad guys, which makes more room for the good guys to proliferate? Or is cinnamon actually contributing to the production of the good guys? I don't, I didn't, I didn't research that far. And next time I find a someone who possibly has an answer for me on this, I will ask them if a cinnamon directly contributes to the proliferation of good gut bacteria. But what we do know is that it does break down the bad guys, okay? So very cool how that works. Um, I'm gonna read a uh, uh, comment here from Stephanie. She said, this is another reason why essential oils are so powerful. Unlike antibiotics, they can pass through the cell membrane and blood brain barriers. They are intelligent in being able to know the difference between good bacteria and bad bacteria, unlike synthetic antibiotics. Yes, that is very incredible feature of like what we're learning about plant medicine. And there's like this whole body of research coming out right now of you about using Ayurvedic medicine and like cinnamon and olive leaf extract. And um, like some of these things have been used for thousands of years now using that to fight uh, antibiotic resistant infections in people. So it's like, oh man, traditional antibiotics didn't work anymore. And now the, now the bad guys are resistant to the medicine. What, who can we send in? And it's like, boom, natural medicine coming in clutch. Okay. This is very exciting. It's just great. Cause we have so many more research articles coming out about it right now. And this is, again, following the trend that natural medicine often does not get clinical attention until, until what? Until it can be used to mitigate the effects of pharmaceutical drugs. So I will never stop being annoyed about that, but it is at least happening. Okay. It is at least happening. So this is good. Um, Ayurvedic medicine got my CKD daughter off of blood pressure meds. Oh, wow. Epic. Yeah. Incredible. So there's more um, ingredients in Ayurvedic medicine that we can get into, such as the mechanisms of action of um, cayenne pepper and of uh, ginger, garlic, um, as well as just like in general herbs, like olive leaf extract. Um, but I just want to hear what is, uh, what's standing out to you guys so far? What is something you've learned as we've begun this discussion about herbs and spices? Don't limit the cinnamon. Yeah. Yeah. And just so you know, when they were doing clinical trials on an effective dose of cinnamon, it was a uh, three quarters of a teaspoon a day. Lillian said, I want to find the honey herb mixture. Very cool. Now, real quick about cinnamon, I, they, it might be effective in smaller quantities, but when they were doing clinical trials to study like um, blood sugar levels and microbial levels in the body. Um, it was three quarters teaspoon per day. Um, there are different types of cinnamons, Felicia. Absolutely. And I, unfortunately, am not a cinnamon expert. I know Ceylon cinnamon is known to be the king for diabetes. Um, however, the true cinnamon that I was, that might be Ceylon, but I have to look it up. The true cinnamon that was done in these clinical trials could have been a different form of cinnamon. Do we have any cinnamon gurus on the call tonight that feel like speaking up? Ceylon is the one you want to use. Ceylon, okay, good one. Okay, cool. That's the one. My, that's the one my mom always recommends when she's talking to people and and literally giving this to them as medicine. She's like, you need to be taking, you know, one or two teaspoons of this stuff a day. 
And so, yeah, that it's always Ceylon. Yeah. Ceylon for diabetes for sure. And, um, uh, yeah, Hannah's saying you didn't realize how much research is out there for cinnamon. I'm telling you, go to PubMed.com and just throw in cinnamon. It's crazy. It's so cool. Like the past 10 and 20 years, there's been so much more research done on these compounds we've been using forever. And it's very cool to, to understand how they're working. And then, um, yeah, so Felicia, you mentioned Ceylon is for immunity. So here's the thing when it comes to like Ceylon is like, I just read that list of like, what was that? Probably like 12 different benefits it has. So um, in terms of how it interacts with your immune system, uh, we do know that it, uh, it, it, can, it can work in conjunction with your immune system. Keep in mind with your immune system that there are a lot of different cell types in your, uh, in your immune system. And some immune cells, their job is to, uh, you know, gob be gobblers. Those are your macrophages. They're there to like gobble up uh, pathogens and dead and dying tissues. And then like, you know, they have tons of enzymes in them that like literally just break stuff down and it gets recycled in your body. It's very cool. So that's one type of cell. Um, but other immune cells their job is to trigger chain reactions in your body. So they're not there to eat the bad guys. They're there to maybe make you tired. So you go down and rest so your body can fight an infection, right? Very interesting. There's also immune cells that cause regional inflammation because your body needs space to eat up all the dead and dying tissue or the damaged tissue or the infected tissue and then rebuild new tissue there. Your body needs space for that. So I always imagine, you know, regional inflammation is like scaffolding. It's like your immune cells are like the scaffolding, like those, the ones that cause inflammation, they come up and you know, if you ever touched a bruise, it's kind of hard, right? And that's because those immune cells have come in and they are like, boop, like put up structure to expand the space in that region of your body so that your other immune cells can gobble up the dead and diseased or infected or dying or damaged tissues and then build new ones. So re like regional inflammation is actually not bad. In fact, there's been a lot more studies lately on, you know, how effective is icing an injury really? Like, should you just let the inflammation happen so that the body can potentially heal faster? Now, sometimes inflammation is not good if it's like pushing against a nerve, that's why it causes pain. And then also brain inflammation can cause brain damage. So there are times you wanna moderate short-term inflammation. But I'm just mentioning you, when you think immune cells, don't just think like, oh, they're gobbling up my bacteria. Like you have immune cells that are triggering all sorts of reactions in your body. And interleukin-6 is one of the pro-inflammatory immune cells, which is why if you have cinnamon coming in and inhibiting interleukin-6 proliferation or interleukin-6 production, you're, you can see a decrease in inflammation in the body because our immune system is like way hyper- uh, agitated today. It shouldn't be as agitated as it is right now. So a lot of people are experiencing inflammation just because their immune system is like overreacting, like all these little things coming in their body, which is why that interleukin-6 inhibition can be helpful. Okay. Back to the chat. So we're still reviewing epic things. Um, people have learned, wow, you guys have been so active. This is awesome. Learning to incorporate more natural herbs and plants in my diet. Cool. Cool. Cause yeah, it's amazing. Cause you're not an herbologist yet. Yud, keep learning. HHE has a uh, new course creator who's a pharmacist and she teaches um, like the pharmacology of herbal remedies. And so she wants to come in and offer, like set up her whole class in our school. So I will let you guys know in that setup because that'll be very cool. She's going to be the one giving you that, like she might be giving you a deeper dive than you ask for. Okay. So I'm just saying, if there's a little bit of organic chemistry that gets thrown your way, just remember you signed up for it. I have garlic and local wild honey flour wildflower honey in your cupboard one week fermenting dawn that's epic um zoom high five you go girl so these are great i'm not going to read them all but i'm really happy to hear that you guys are learning and sharing so much about it very cool so all right what should we talk about next first of all any questions Okay, so we're going to move on to olive leaf extract, and then we will check the time and potentially wrap up. So um, olive leaf extract is another one of those um, 
like herbs that has been used for literally centuries. And they can track its usage throughout like so many different countries, um, you know, used in fevers, used in flus, used in, um, I feel like it was very much so used in a pandemic. By the way, have you guys ever heard of the uh, plausibility that the um, the Black Plague that happened in Europe was actually more correlated, not just because of the, um, you know, the virus going around was super deadly, but that was right after an industrial era where tons of heavy metals were put into the atmosphere. And because of the level of heavy metal toxicity among people, it inhibited so many like natural mechanisms in their body that it compromised their immune system. So then they had a virus go around that uh, ended up wiping people out much easier than their normal body, you know, in full homeostasis, whatever. I just, I, it's something I'm looking into because that was recently, they're recently doing some more research on that. Just as we're learning more and more about heavy metals inhibit like enzymatic reactions in the body and hormonal reactions in the body, just how much they can mess it up. They were like, very interesting that the Black Plague happened right after this huge industrial boom where all these heavy metals were shot up into the atmosphere. It's interesting, right? Like, I'm not I'm not telling you this as fact right now because I have more research to do, but I was like, that's very plausible. That's very plausible. Yes. Um. All right. I am pulling up my article on olive leaves. So olive leaves were used by old civilizations for the care of many illnesses. Ancient Egyptians used olive leaves for mummifying bodies of their pharaohs. In addition, olive leaves became very popular uh, folk remedy for fever. In the 1800s, the British used them to handle tropical diseases such as malaria. And in the middle of the previous century, olive leaf extract was found to be positively, positively acting on hypertension. Since then, research has only increased. Over the past few years, a lot of attention has been paid to obtaining biologically active compounds from natural sources. And then it gets into where it's coming from and um, some of the different mechanisms of action. Now, there's one thing I want to mention about olive leaf. Um, you guys might have heard of cytokine storms before. Have you guys ever heard of a cytokine storm in someone's body? So some herbs work by directly targeting like bacteria and pathogenic organisms. Other herbs work by agitating your immune system and telling your immune system to kick it into high gear. Cause sometimes people's immune systems are actually under responding to a sickness. Sometimes someone has a viral infection or has a bacterial or has a parasitic or has a fungal infection. And the immune system is just kind of like not picking it up. It's kind of out to lunch. And so there are certain herbs and especially this actually is how homeopathy works for anyone who uses homeopathy. Homeopathy works by agitate like it, it it's it's like a very 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 diluted molecule of a um of a poisonous plant of a venom of a um um what is, else is there besides besides venoms and poisons and uh just an like most of the time it's an agitating substance and it comes into the body and it triggers the immune system to have a reaction that very perfectly mirrors the reaction needed to fight off that that actual viral or bacterial infection you're facing. So in other words, let's say I get a bacterial infection in my lungs and my body's not fighting it off well. And I look up a homeopathy chart and I'm like looking up, um, okay, what is what homeopathy matches the symptoms in my lungs? It's going to give me a homeopathy that when I take it, it triggers that immune reaction in my body, which then ends up fighting off the bacterial infection in my lungs. So this is to say certain herbs and natural remedies work by agitating the immune system to produce more cytokines or to boost the um, uh, level of immune cell activity in your body. So that's good when someone's having an underreaction in their immune system. It can be bad if someone's currently having an overreaction, which is why during COVID and cytokine storms were very prevalent because... Um, there was a high level of immune system dysregulation. There were certain people who got worse, the more herbal remedies they took. And that could be, uh, you know, they prescribe that to the fact that some herbal remedies do bolster an immune response. And if they're already having an overreaction, that might not be helpful for them in that certain circumstance. Does that make sense? 
Tell me if I'm explaining that properly. So just keep that in mind in the back of your head. And I would actually say this is probably true for like half of natural medicine. Sometimes it gives you exactly what your body needs. And other times it just like pokes your body and is like, okay. Cause like even cold, like saunas, do you guys think saunas are like so good for you? Saunas are, saunas are like that much heat. Your body is like swearing. Your body's swearing. It's like, it's like, oh, like we have got to clean up this area and like get all the junk out of our cells or we're not going to make it. We're not going to survive these high temperatures unless we like get out with the old and in with the new and cold plunges, same things. It's like, it's, it's actually a little stressful to your body, but what it does is it induces cellular cleanup. Your cells are like, I got to get my shit together or we're not going to make it. And so if you want to do more research on that, that's what the mechanism of heat shock proteins as well as cold shock proteins are. They're little cellular brooms that when you get like exposed to high levels of heat or high levels of cold, it shocks the body. And these like guys come out and they just like start sweeping up around the cells and out with the old and in with the new. So that's just to say some, um, some herbal things like totally give you what you need and calm you down and fight the infections and other things stimulate your body to, uh, you know, fight the fight. Okay. Um, Stephanie mentioned, isn't homeopathy light cures? Like, yep, exactly. In fact, another form of homeopathy is using your own excrement to create medicine. And when mom used to teach the TNC live and she got to the section on homeopathy, um, uh, I, one year she had a gal in class who was sick and, um, they burned her, um, like it was, it must've been her snot and did made a, like a reduction. I mean, you totally reduce it. You're not taking a big dose of this, but it was like, I forget exactly how they made it, but they used her own excrement to burn homeopathy, which she then took. And um, yeah, she was good by like, I want to say like the next day or something. So sometimes like your body, uh, it was something about the way it was administered. The immune cells recognized at this time and then mounted an immune response because now they were recognizing it. But if you're not going to use your own excrement, obviously, um, you know, using a plant medicine or a frequency to trigger that same reaction, the body can be helpful. Okay. Um, Hannah mentioned, so it does what they claim vaccines are supposed to do, but way better. So yeah, Hannah, totally. When I explain homeopathy, like that is like the closest thing to vaccines in the natural medicine world is like, that's, that's the premise of it. It's the premise of it. I'm really bummed they added a lot of stuff to vaccines because the concept of vaccine is actually very smart. And, and I'll explain this why, um, you know, you have your innate immune system, which is like the frontline acting 24 seven immune cells. And then you have your adaptive immune system and the adaptive immune system takes three to 14 days to figure out how to break down a new invader in the body. So your innate immune system is running 24 seven around the clock. It's doing so much work for you right now. You guys don't even know. It's like fighting off infections. You would have never known about. It's also cleaning up dead cells. So it assists with internal cleanup as well as external cleanup. Okay. So your, your innate immune system is running around the clock, your adaptive immune system. They're looking for new, like more novel things that are happening in the body. And we're not going to get into it all of it right now. We will in um, a call on immunology, but the time it takes for it to figure out how to crack the code to produce the right antibody to attach to that new infectious agent so that that antibody then can, can then signal a, uh, you know, a macrophage or an immune cell to come gobble it up that, that lock and key process, it's testing millions of configurations, trying to create the right lock and key. So if this is like a new virus, like I'm a new virus and I'm in your body and I'm like causing an infection, your innate immune, immune cells and the antibodies you already have don't know how to attach to this because it's totally new. So it's like trying to attach to it and it, it can't. So that's when your adaptive immune cells, they're going to drag this thing to a lymph node um, and start trying all these different, like it will produce thousands, like millions of, ant that's why your lymph nodes swell when you're fighting a new infection because all of a sudden your lymph nodes are like filling with antibodies trying to figure out the right lock and key. And when it finally finds it, then it starts making that antibody and it gives the code to your white blood cells that then 
uh, send that throughout your body. Okay. But that process can take three to 14 days to find the right lock and key. So the, the concept of vaccine is great because it's like, Hey, if we can give people a small, like, um, manageable dose of this viral particle or very dangerous pathogen, their body can configure that antibody under like when it's not under attack or under like a, you know, a debilitating dose of it. So like the concept of it's great. It's just, yeah, they've added a lot of things to it. And, um, and, uh, also giving, um, that level of like immune stimulating substance to an infant, their immune system really is not equipped to handle it. Um, and it can confuse their T cells really early on in life, which then leads to like gut health disorders and autoimmune conditions and allergies. So, and that that's just from T cell confusion because you gave someone's immune system something very extreme, very early. Okay. Wow. Thank you for another tangent. On, uh, so that's the difference between innate and adaptive immune system. Are you guys kind of clear on that? Innate's running 24 seven. Adaptive is looking to like make more novel solutions to invaders. Yeah. Yeah. Renee mentioned, always wondered what was in the swollen nodes. It's antibodies. Totally. So um, just tons of like, because it, it, it can swell from the size of like um smaller than an almond. It's almost the size of a golf ball during infection. Almost. It's like a large grape. And uh, so, yeah, anytime someone has swollen lymph nodes under their neck, you really want to get them checked for underlying dental infection. Because that could be what is causing a lot of their issues is an underlying dental infection. In fact, we've had people get their teeth cleaned up. And their swollen lymph nodes in their neck that they've had their whole life, just like gone in days. So definitely a really good thing to look for. See if someone has underlying dental work that needs to get done. Mm -hmm. Epic. So we're at the top of the hour. You guys want more calls on uh, mechanisms of action of other herbs and like and things like that? I think it's pretty cool to learn about. If I uh, have more prep, I can like make a PowerPoint that has like diagrams. If you're a visual learner, to understand like what is cayenne pepper doing, what is olive leaf doing, but it's very apparent these things have multiple different effects on the body. It's not just one thing, so it's very cool to learn about. It's like I'm like wow, cinnamon, jeez incredible. So yeah, we'll definitely get that put together for you guys to learn more about how it's working. Um, like I said, contraindications, uh, cayenne is definitely a blood pressure reducer. So if someone's already dealing with low blood pressure, you do not, you don't want to be throwing a lot of cayenne pepper in their body. It can um, cause their blood pressure to drop too low. So be mindful of that. Um, someone already mentioned you know, they mentioned MS, um, which can be, um, you know, that in that situation, you have confused immune cells. So anytime there's like MS or um, an autoimmune condition, you have confused immune cells. And they, they can be correctly educated. So if people say autoimmune conditions are irreversible, that's not true. That's not true. You can, you can correctly educate the immune system. It take, it does take a while. Um, well, actually, according to the words of Dr. Essen, he doesn't like using the word cure, but he does say you can put someone into remission permanently. <laughs> so it's not curable, it's not reversible, but you can put someone into permanent remission. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That said, um, herbs can definitely agitate someone who is dealing with, uh, you know, an um, unregulated immune system. So just keep that in mind. And... Uh, let's get a pharmacist in here to talk about other contraindications. Maybe when we do a more elaborate um, dive into some of these things, that's one thing I'm really excited for this gal. Cause she practiced pharmacy, you know, she was a pharmacist for how many years? And then she's like, I got to get out of here. Went off the deep end into herbs. So she's the one who can provide that education on like, okay, if your clients on this medication, by the way, we now have that available for you guys for when you start coaching, if you ever have a client that has a lot of medications and you want them to compare their meds to their, um, 
holistic protocol. We have um, a couple nurses and a pharmacist now on the, as contractors for HHG that you guys can lean on if you ever want to get that checked with the clients you work with. Just have them book a call. It's cheap too. It's like 40 bucks an hour. I couldn't believe it. Actually, one gallon in one state is over 100. It really depends on the state you live in. But just know that that's an available resource for you if you have someone on a lot of meds and you want to get them checked to make sure your holistic protocol just, you know, they should talk to their doctor, but their doctor's not going to know what natural medicine does. But uh, yeah, just it's a good thing to have checked out because some of the stuff's really fast acting. Amy, is that when we we graduate, we'll have access to that? I mean, if you're using someone now, like, I mean, if you're coaching right now, you can reach out at any time. I will give the contact information to Rachel, but we should probably just get that posted in the courses itself. I'm trying to decide if that would belong in a new student orientation or in the actual certification program itself or in R in, or in replays and resources. It probably will be an R and R Maria. Okay. It's just, there, there isn't any, do you know if there's anything like a link online where one could go in and say, okay, she's on this medication. Is this herb counterindicated? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, that resource, yeah. that resource okay. makes it. I'm sure that, is anyone aware of a resource that does that? Okay. Yeah, I'm not, I don't know yet, but that would be very spectacular. If that's the case. Thank you. All right. Yeah, no problem. All right. Any other, any other questions? Who can commit to using the word mechanism of action in, in some of their research moving forward? Put a one in the chat. If you're like, yes, if that's the one thing I got out of today's call, I will now be looking up the mechanisms of action of natural medicine. Very helpful to get more details on exactly how it works. Excellent. I'm like doing that thing where I like go through my brain and I'm like scanning it for like other things I really needed to make sure got out on today's call. So if I'm ever quiet, like you can always speak up, but I'm just doing like a little like brain scan. I have another question, Amy. Um, this Dr. Essen you mentioned, yeah. is it E-S-S-E-N? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, he's, an, he's an autoimmune specialist and he practices out of Minnesota and his clinic is called Whole Life Clinic out of Minnesota with Dr. Essen. Um, he does see people on a, you know, one appointment at a time thing, but he also does have a package for people with autoimmune conditions. I believe it's $5,000 and he promises to work with you until you're in remission, which is incredible, but he runs labs, um, through, um, I think it's Cyrex labs, but there's certain panels you want to run. If someone has an autoimmune condition that they do not run at the doctor's office mm -hmm. because they the medical version of treating autoimmune conditions is putting someone on immunosuppressants for the rest of their life, which aren't like always terrible in the short term use to uh, give someone like a breath of relief. So I'm not like an anti-medicine person, guys. Just the, the issue I have is most of these medications are meant to be used for a short amount of time, right? Even like psychiatric drugs. Like if there's an anxiety medication or a depression med medication that can get someone out of bed and on their feet again, great. Like that's wonderful, but then go in and look at like what's really going on in this person's gut or in their psychology or in their relationships or in, you know, their brain scans to figure out what a long-term solution is. But so I'm just saying that when it comes to the immunosuppressant drugs, I know people who took immunosuppressants for a short period and it quite literally got them on their feet again, able to then be in a position to be able to heal their body. So yeah. I'm just, I'm not talking bad about it. However, it's very cool because Dr. Essen does get to the root cause of what's going on. And, um, and, uh, yeah, does that with a combination of diet supplementation and encouragement to pursue somatic therapy so that you can get out like release past trauma. That's often keeping a body in fight or flight, which is like one of the number one immunosuppressants and not a good way out there is fight or flight. Right. Oh, cool, Don. Awesome collection of herbal of herbal books you have out there. All right. Well, we can go ahead and uh, um, do a soft wrap up of today's call. Um, I would still love to hear if there's any other questions or takeaways that anyone feels inclined to share 
वो देखो Will this video be on replay? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I know I talked a little fast. Nalani, were you sharing that with the whole group or just with uh just with me? Because I got the recipe for your curry chicken salad, and I just want to know if I can be a giver and uh yes. share. Be a, be a giver definitely yeah. yeah i i just threw it out there amazing amazing and it's not mine it's totally earth fairs so yay thank you so much for sharing it sounds exquisite and uh yeah by the way guys we didn't get into all the herbs but fresh parsley and fresh cilantro in your salads great move great move for like all the anti-inflammatory and blood pressure benefits of parsley and cinnamon is a heavy metal um, detoxifier too. So that's epic. Ronnie mentioned, I didn't catch the specific way to use olive leaf. So in our household, we typically used olive leaf extract and uh, we, um, Barleen's, the brand Barleen's makes a phenomenal olive leaf extract if you want to get a liquid form of it. Um, or a tablet form, but there are quite a few olive leaf extracts out there. Pure also makes a, a good olive leaf extract. So those are some of the ways. Gaia, yes, yes, yes. I've used theirs before, Anne. Barleen's is totally my favorite. Barleen's rocks. They're peppermint liquid olive leaf extract. Very powerful. Oh, I forgot to mention for grandma, not grandma, Auntie Lana. I call her grandma to my friends. Um, we did use... Um, breathe the breathe blend by um every essential oil line has a breathe easy blend but we happen to have doTERRA's on hand but i know there's like a lot of brands out there that are great um but we use that on her lungs and it was very helpful for her as well just topical we did like three or four drops um on the lungs very helpful for respiratory conditions and for coughs so that was another thing we did as well as the um mulling compress What do you use olive leaf to treat? So Hannah, olive leaf is, um, it is antiviral, antifungal, and antibiotical. So it's just an antimicrobial is like the broad term use for when it does all of those things. So you might use that if someone is dealing with a cough. I've taken that when I'm fighting off a cold sore. Um, different people have used it in their treatment of candida. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I forgot. ADP emulsified. Oh, that's different than olive leaf. Thank you. That's why I didn't mention it. Thank you, brain. That's a separate. Now we're talking about oil of oregano. ADP emulsified oil of oregano is so powerful as an antimicrobial agent. In fact, oil of oregano in some clinical trials was actually like outperforming other and you know pharmaceutical forms of antimicrobial agents in um in some really really Dr. Scott Johnson talks about it in his book on essential oils what were they fighting it was like it was terrible MRSA was it no don't quote me on that it was it was bad though it was like up there and emulsified oil of oregano and oil um essential oil version of oil of oregano which is different than normal um like olive sorry, normal um, oil-based oil oregano. It um it was very, 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 very powerful. Now that said, you guys, some of these things you don't want to be taking long-term because it can wear on the stomach, I mean, on the intestinal lining. So oil oregano is something that you um, take, uh, you know, maybe for six days and then take a couple days of a break. And none of these you want to be taking longer than a month. Very, can be very hard on the small intestines. Yeah, Jeanette, I imagine you could use mulling with castor oil. I have not done it, but I have I have heard of this as castor oil is a driver into the, yeah. Mm. Haven't done it yet, though. I don't know if there's any uh, mulling castor oil fans out there, but that's probably like a very classic herbal remedy. Yeah, if you guys ever want to just get like stoked on essential oils, go look in the human body master guide for the call we did with Dr. I believe it's Dr. Scott Johnson, but look up, it's either Dr. Johnson or Dr. Scott. One of those is in there. 
because he did a book, he wrote several books on essential oils and he showed us a PowerPoint of just like clinical trial after clinical trial after clinical trial of um, essential oils. And it was very cool. Like citrus for depression was very, very powerful. And uh, oil of oregano was very powerful internally for treating like really gnarly um, infections. And then um, black cumin oil was phenomenal in breaking addictions. There's some great ones. So definitely watch that one. It was about an, slightly over an hour long. It's packed with information. Goodbye, everyone who's watching the re replay. We love you.